Um, okay, the next question is, uh, because of the example of Malcolm and the Nation of Islam, it has become almost cliche for incarcerated persons to adopt Islam and the search for knowledge as core to their personal redemption. And so the, the viewer is interested in your take on that legacy for today's prison education and personal redemption efforts slash narratives. Uh, and so I think, you know, again, going back to the pop culture, there's, remember in Living Color, there's like, the, I forgot the character's name, but he goes to prison and comes out using all of these very big words and sort of the implication is that uh, the nation has become a place for his education and, and knowledge and he becomes enlightened there, but does so in a way that is, um, I mean, they, they sort of poke fun at it a little bit, but there does seem to be something to uh, people discovering a spirituality through the nation while incarcerated. And I guess the question is kind of getting at, is there something to the redemption that folks find in, the, in that religion in prison um, that's analogous to efforts just around general education or redemption efforts for the current moment around you know, second chances and, and uh, reducing recidivism, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously there are many reasons to adopt spirituality while caged, right? I mean, there's, right. yeah. you know, so I think just setting that aside and not um, trivializing that in any way. Um, but also, I mean, I'm a big supporter, um, very active in political education efforts inside working with incarcerated people to make sure that um, radical material gets into prisons. Um, you know, it's a, the next project I'm working on is a biography of Martin Sastre, who is um, a, a figure in the book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he so he becomes a political prisoner, um, actually, in the late 60s. But before that, he characterizes himself as a politicized prisoner, someone who came to prison and became politicized around conditions of confinement. And I think that happens for so many folks who um, understand the confinement, not only of the prison in real time, but the confinement of of their life prior to coming to prison. Um, to, to sort of explore through books, whether it's the autobiography of Malcolm X or other radical literature like George Jackson, Asada, uh, and others, to sort of understand America writ large um, as, a, as a carceral state, as a, a prison nation that creates all sorts of forms of criminalization um, and, and enclosure. So, so I think the prison is absolutely a space of, of politicization um, and we should encourage that and organize with people inside um, and really make sure that uh, radical literature gets inside. Because if we think back to M Malcolm's own politicization in prison, I mean, I think he plays up in the autobiography the extent to which he's apolitical when he comes to prison, like his parents right. were Bunnyites, so he's not new to this. Right. But it's through the debate team, it's through the library and, and reading literature. And for so many of these folks that I write about who are engaged in this activism, I mean, the, the Nation of Islam isn't just um, hosting Juma on Fridays. They're also doing Black history lessons. They're also teaching current events. So it's a whole program of understanding the world around you and your role in it. And I think that's something that, um, that we should all be supportive of. Yeah. Um, so today with the time that I have, I, I think I'm going to sort of tell the story through a single document. Um, that I came across, and it was a letter from an incarcerated Muslim, Th uh, Thomas Bratcher, to Malcolm X, who he, he had never met, and he was incarcerated at the time at um, the notorious Attica prison in New York. Um, I apologize for using a mugshot. This is the only photograph I've ever been able to locate of Thomas Bratcher. I think it kind of speaks in part to the erasure of um, incarcerated people from these struggles uh, and the way that the sort of only documentation that we often have is through these um, violent state um, archives. So Bratcher wrote this letter um, to Malcolm X in late 1961, right before these uh, stories that I opened with. And I'm sort of just giving you a sense of what the document looked like, but then um, at the bottom I have kind of the piece typed out that I'll be talking about. So he's writing Malcolm actually with quite a bit of optimism in 1961. And what he describes, um, here, I'll slide this over so it's a little easier to read. Um, what he describes basically is a, a, a court case, Samarian v. McGinnis, that um, is coming up 
and they're fighting for their right to freedom of religious worship. He says rights guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. We've been persecuted, beaten, marred, both mentally and physically, put in isolation, segregation, protection, and solitary confinement, but not by the will of Allah. Our fight has come to almost come to an end. Victory is now in sight. So part of the context to understanding why he might be optimistic in 1961 is actually that you have to go back almost a century to a Supreme Court ruling, Ruffin v. Commonwealth, um, which stated that incarcerated people were literally, quote, a slave of the state. So from 19, 1871 up until this period, um, incarcerated people are seen to have no constitutional rights. Uh, this is known as the hands-off period where the judicial branch essentially deemed incarcerated people um, under the sole jurisdiction of corrections and that they had nothing to say about conditions of incarceration. Um, so part of the larger implications of fighting for religious rights in prisons was fighting for the basic right to, um, to constitutional protections. So I show this picture in part, this is another one of the plaintiffs, um, Joseph Maggetti here carrying all these materials and it's not just legal materials that he's carrying, but he's actually carrying um, these diaries where they meticulously um, documented all the various ways that they were being oppressed. Um, so part of the things that they're asking for more specifically in terms of um, rights um, to religious freedom, one is access to the Quran. Um, they were given access to the Quran, but only in Arabic only in English. So they were asking for an English to Arabic um, translation. And part of the reason the, the prison officials did not want them to have that was that they were worried they would write in Arabic and use it as code, um, which they did. Um, so that was one thing that they were asking for. The second was the, the ability to correspond with ministers. So they were forbidden from, from writing people like Malcolm X under the pretense that if you had a criminal conviction, you couldn't um, correspond with someone. Um, who also had one. So someone like Malcolm or other ministers in the nation who had criminal records were um, forbidden from writing with incarcerated people. And the last was access to black newspapers. So this is all prior to the development of Muhammad Speaks um, as the official organ of the, of the nation. So the way that incarcerated people would sort of build their lessons and their surahs was through um, the Amsterdam News, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Los Angeles Herald Dispatch, and black newspapers that were publishing editorials by Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. So the second part of this letter I wanted to share um, is, you know, Bratcher's talking about we've compounded all of this evidence over a period of two years to bring the state commissioner and the warden um, and these tyrants sort of to justice. Um, and they consolidated these into one big trial and I've highlighted this name at the bottom, Martin X. I mentioned at the beginning, I'm working on a, a political biography of him. And later, Martin X. Sastre in the late 60s and early 70s becomes this internationally recognized political prisoner because he's framed um, during the Buffalo Uprising of 1967. But early in the 1950s um, and early 1960s, he actually converts to Islam and he's part of the Nation of Islam and he's a jailhouse lawyer um, and he's the one who's sort of preparing all of these legal uh, cases that are going to the courts. So what he would do is write a writ and people could simply fill in their names. So he's writing all these cases that people can consolidate into one trial. But the other thing I want to emphasize is that the legal strategy that the Nation of Islam is employing is just one of many um, that incarcerated Muslims in particular are using. Um, the other thing that Sastre sort of theorizes and puts into play at Attica at this time period is that they're essentially being punished um, for practicing Islam, for having newspapers um, like, like the Amsterdam News in their cells, and they're being put in solitary confinement. And when they're put in solitary, they often lose um, what's called good time or earned time off of your sentence. Um, so there's sort of this two-part mechanism of repression that's happening where they're being put in solitary confinement, and then they're losing good time for the time spent in solitary. And what Sastre theorizes is that this is the central mechanism of repression in the prison. So what they'll do is they'll purposefully fill solitary confinement. They'll commit disciplinary infractions on purpose, um, fill solitary, and then prison officials have to make this choice of whether or not to fill solitary with radicalized, politicized prisoners um, or sort of undermine this 
arbitrary system of um, repression that they've set up. So it's they're they're engaging in hunger strikes, direct action protests, and takeovers of solitary. And one of the points I make in the book is that this idea of taking over solitary, which is essentially the jail within the prison, actually coincides with um, or even precedes the Albany movement and the idea of filling the jails and jail Nobel in the civil rights movement in the South. So it's not to suggest necessarily that these are in conversation with one another, but to that question of erasure and what we remember, it's that um, the jail no bail strategy of people purposely filling, filling places like Parchman Prison um, and refusing bail actually um, is being done by incarcerated Muslims in Attica. Um, and one we remember in sort of the story of the civil rights movement and the other has been um, forgotten or erased. And this is a, a portrait of Martin Sastre that was done in the in the 70s by one of his comrades who tried to free him. And he was he had his sentence commuted in 1975. So this is from a later part in the letter. Um, and Bratcher is basically talking about how they've compounded all of this evidence for several years to bring this case against the state commissioner and the warden of Attica, um, calling 20 Muslims as witnesses from every major prison in the state. Um, to sort of be coalesced into this one trial. And one of the reasons I bring this up is because in these early cases that they brought um, prior to Samarian v. McGinnis, they were just litigating issues like access to the Quran. So that by the time they get to trial, essentially the judge says, you can imagine what prison officials did. They made sure that by the time it got to trial, they actually did have access to the Quran. So the judge says, well, there's nothing left here to litigate. And when the plaintiffs start raising things like solitary confinement and good time practices, the judge says, well, that's not actually something that I can litigate because it's not in the writ. So he does sort of give them an opening, which he says, you know, if you really wanted to change the rules of the prison, you shouldn't sue the warden because the warden doesn't make the rules the state commissioner does. So there's sort of this period of um, trying new strategies throughout the late 1950s and the 60s where two things happen. There's a widening of the scope of the trial to include persecution for religion as well as access to the Quran and to black newspapers. And there's a widening of who's being charged so, um, or sued. So it's not just the warden, it's eventually the state commissioner and then the governor. Um, and the other piece of this letter that I wanted to bring your attention to is he talks about um, being held in solitary confinement with um, Brother Sastre X, Sumerian X, um, so at the time, I didn't know who Martin X. Sastre was. I sort of looked up. Um, um, again, there aren't very many photos of, of Sastre either. This is a portrait painted by one of his um, political comrades um, later in life. So Sastre actually becomes this really well-known uh, political prisoner in the late 1960s, early 1970s. By that point, he gets out in 64, starts an Afro-Asian bookstore um, in Buffalo, New York. And he has this whole sort of political, um, second political life that's much better known in the late 60s, early 70s as a political prisoner who's eventually has his sentence commuted um, by Governor Kerry in 1975. But during this earlier period, he's what he would come to describe as a politicized prisoner, where he converted to the Nation of Islam, um, became politicized around these issues, and he was also a, a a jailhouse lawyer who's the one, he is the one who's writing all of these cases that are being compounded um, into a big trial. And what he would do is he would write exactly the same writ and then give them to people to write their name onto. So there's all these ways in which the state is sort of um, cracking down on this. They develop a rule where you can't have legal materials that are not your own in your cell. Um, and that's a disciplinary infraction that's specifically targeted at jailhouse lawyers who are writing writs on behalf of other people. Um, the other thing that I want to point out about Sastre is he's not just a jailhouse lawyer sort of using prison litigation, um, but he's also using direct action um, and nonviolent resistance. So one of the things, because you see the use of solitary confinement as a way to break up organizing inside, um, he suggests that they take over solitary confinement, that they commit um, on purpose infractions which are designed to put them in solitary confinement. And what I think is interesting about this is, in part, what I point out in the book is that he starts this um, idea about taking over solitary at about the same time that the jail no bail strategy in the South um, also gets going in South Carolina and later in Georgia. And one of these, if you're familiar with jail no bail, 
has its sort of um, place in the annals of civil rights history as the strategy of, you know, instead of posting bail and losing money over and over, over just getting arrested and arrested, taking the, the mechanism of repression, you know, the jail and filling it until it's no longer effective. And that's what Sastre is talking about with the sort of jail within the prison, which is solitary. He says the box, once the box, um, you know, breaks down, the whole system um, follows because that's the central mechanism of repression.